Hello and welcome. This webinar will concentrate on the changes in the NHBC 2024 standards and include changes to Chapter 6.2, Timber Frame, to Chapter 7.1, Flat Roofs. This is one of a series of webinars giving the changes to 2024 NHBC standards. These changes come into effect from any foundation placed on or after 1st of January 2024. This includes major changes to Chapter 6 and some lesser changes to Chapter 7.1. Chapter 6.2 External Timber Frame Walls The Structural Timber Association STA Advice Note 4 on Timber Frame Erection Tolerances has been referenced at the start of this clause. This ties in with a new subsection on Timber Frame Erection Tolerances Erection tolerances following the STA guidance are generally acceptable. British and European standard references for the strength grading of timber has been updated, but this does not represent a technical change. Minimum stud target sizes have been updated from 37 mm to 38 mm. This reflects current industry practice for stud sizes in timber frame buildings as well as aligning with relevant British standards such as BS 8000, Part 8 2023 and the STA Patron Book. Additional guidance within the subsection that discusses the provision of studs for wall tie fixing has been added. New guidance states that additional studs and noggings may be required to provide a backing for cavity barriers where they do not align with structural framing members. In Clause 6.2.8 on Differential Movement, guidance on floor zone movement joints in lightweight cladding have been improved and clarified. Guidance on the specification of compressible filler materials in differential movement gaps has been expanded, with further information on the sizing these material and sizing of gaps to accommodate them. Figure 26, showing a floor zone movement gap in lightweight cladding has been improved. In Clause 6.2.9, a new subsection on fire resistance has been created. References have been included at the start of the clause to the Structural Timber Association pattern books for fire resistance of timber frame buildings. Guidance is also provided on suitable supporting evidence, such as test evidence data, to the relevant British and European standards. In Clause 6.2.10, a new subsection on drainage and ventilation has been created. This new subsection contains both existing guidance on items such as open perpens and masonry cladding, as well as new guidance on perpen placement at ground level and at horizontal interruptions to cavities, for example, cavity barrier and or cavity trays. A new subsection on drainage and ventilation to cavities behind lightweight cladding has been included as well as updated guidance on cavity widths behind lightweight tile hung cladding. New guidance has also been included within the cavity tray subsections on locations, installation and material specification based on technical guidance note 6.207. Guidance contained within figure 42 on the location of sole plates above external ground level has now been incorporated into main body of the text. The lowest timber should be a minimum of 150 mm above finished ground level. This may be reduced to 75 mm in situations where the site is not subject to a high water table or where the cavity will not have standing water. Clause 6.2.10 Protection from Moisture includes a new subsection on DPCs and cavity trays. This new subsection includes existing guidance which was contained elsewhere within the standards. Guidance on DPCs and cavity trays is now separated to improve clarity of guidance. This includes cavity vents should be equivalent to open brick perpen joints every 1.2 meters, located to prevent the ingress of rain located to drain moisture from the cavity. Clause 6.2.10 states, DPCs and cavity trays should be lapped with the DPM and AVCL to enhance air tightness at sole plate. Installed over horizontal timber cavity barriers, 
except under eaves and verge and lapped behind the breather membrane by 100 millimeters. Cavity trays should be installed over openings at abutments and where specified at sole plate level. Have weep holes to deflect moisture out of the cavity over openings or perp and ventilators where cavity trays are continuous. Be lapped behind the breather membrane by at least 100 millimeters to deflect moisture away from the sheeting board. Throughout Chapter 6.2, references to vapor control layers have been updated to state air and vapor control layers to reflect general changes in construction vocabulary as well as British standards such as BS 5250. Guidance contained within Chapter 6.10 light steel frame floors and walls on condensation risk calculation has now also been incorporated into clause 6.2.12 with guidance on suitable boundary conditions for calculations a high resistance air and vapor control layer should be provided unless risk analysis shows it is not necessary and can be provided by another solution compliant with the nhpc technical requirements In Clause 6.2.12, guidance on the installation of air and vapor control layers has been expanded. Air and vapor control layers should be mechanically lapped over studs and rails. Self-adhesive tapes can be used as a secondary measure. We have also included new guidance on material specification for floor zone air tightness membranes. Air tightness membranes which wrap around the edges of floor cassettes should be airtight but moisture vapor permeable. Guidance on partial fill external wall cavity insulation has been expanded in clause 6.215. New guidance includes the following points. A clear cavity should be provided between the insulation and cladding. Breather membranes should be used to protect the timber frame and sheeting board and a secondary membrane may be required to the cavity phase of the insulation depending on manufacturer's instructions and independent technical approval. Stud locator marks may need to be transferred to the insulation and or secondary breather membrane to allow wall tie fixings to be installed into the studs. Wall ties should transfer loads directly into the timber frame structure and not via the insulation. Cavity barriers should fully close the cavity and ensure that they are not likely to fail as a result of failure of the cavity insulation. Chapter 6.3 Internal Walls Note added to Clause 6.3.4 Table 1 to clarify the height of the story and the roof type of buildings up to three stories. Note added to clause 6.3.4 to state, minimum bearing lengths for lintels should be in accordance with manufacturer's recommendations. There is clarification that on load bearing timber walls, the lowest sole plate should be positioned at or above the internal finish floor level, and further clarification that multi studs should be included to support multiple joists, beam girder trusses, and other load points. There is additional guidance on timber grading and British standards. This diagram has been revised. Clarification is added that rock fiber quills should be installed above and below the roofing underlay and the materials must be appropriate for the application. The same drawing has also been revised for Chapter 7.216, Fire Stopping and Cavity Barriers for Timber Frame Construction. Chapter 6.4 timber and upper concrete floors. New guidance has been extended to the requirement for testing and certification of ancillary products to maintain the fire resistance of the floor. It gives options on how to achieve this. Span tables have been aligned with BM Trada Technology Limited. Table 1 and 2 give permissible clear spans of simply supported domestic floor joists of solid timbers. Areas in bold text has normal bearing increase from 40 mm to 38 
to 50 millimeters. Guidance is updated to reflect instantaneous deflection limits of floor joists. Floors formed by bottom cord of an attic truss must meet this guidance. Joist clearance spacing detail has been reintroduced. Clearance between 25 to 75 mm is now required. Chapter 6.5 Steelwork In clause 6.5.6 .6 on connections, changes to figure 3 and figure 4 have added figure references for joints between beams of similar sizes. We will now look at the changes to Chapter 6.6 .6, Staircases. There is a slight change of definitions redefining the going and guarding. There is an additional bullet point on landing design included in the provision of information. Some minor removal of script, leaving the above. The BCA Note 19 has now been withdrawn. There is a minor clarification to confirm that when stairs form part of means of escape, they should meet the building regulations. In landings, there is improved guidance to cover design, deflection deformation and undue movement. Protective guarding. Table 2 has been added for loadings on parapets, barriers and balustrades for residential usage. A 100mm sphere is not allowed to pass through any openings. In Northern Ireland and Scotland, balustrading has been amended to state a stair and the lowest edge of the protective barrier may be larger than 100mm provided the lowest edge of the barrier is no more than 50 mm above and parallel to the pitch line of the stair. On staircases, there is an additional note to state that timber staircases should be adequately fixed to the supporting structure according to the guidance supplied by the manufacturers. Where fixing to light gauge steel, Stud manufacturers should be consulted to ensure the framing can adequately support the staircase loads. Properly constructed to transmit loads without undue movement. Support the solid fixings for the top of flights, nosings, newels. There is also a note on durability. There is further amendments to Clause 14 steel staircases regarding protective coatings, Clause 15 on compliance, Clause 16 on protection from residual moisture from a concrete floor and isolating DPC should be placed below the staircase. We now move on to Chapter 6.7, Doors, Windows and Glazing. This chapter gives a new terms and definitions section. It gives extensive guidance on in-house performance being appropriate to the conditions. Work shall comply with all relevant national building regulations covering weather tightness, including performance standards, thermal bridging around openings, air tightness, ensuring continuity of the air barrier, thermal movement, to incorporate expansion and contraction of the frames, strength to adequately withstand operational loads, durability have a minimum service lifespan of at least 40 years. Minor changes to other sections, for example, reference to third party accreditation for timber doors and windows, moisture content to timber doors and windows, guidance on tolerances and fixings has been made. In chapter 6.8, fireplaces, chimneys and flues, there are some minor changes. There is a requirement that false chimneys shall comply with technical requirement R3 and are assessed and passed by an independent technical approval authority accepted by NHBC. 
again, minor changes to chapter 6.10, light steel framed walls and doors. Minor changes relate to grammatical changes, galvanizing thickness, and air and vapor control layers. As with some previous chapters, in 6.11, render, there are minor grammatical changes, but also further clarification on weep holes and cavity trays. Additional guidance for weep holes, that stop ends are required and at least two weep holes per opening is required, with an additional bullet point for parapet walls at no more than one meter centers. Chapter 7.1, flat roofs, terraces and balconies. There are some grammatical changes. There is also a new clause. The technical requirements for waterproofing of raised podiums has been harmonized with chapter 5.4. Design for drainage of balconies and terraces should follow BS 8579 for the provision of outlets with effective clearance, capacity and profile shape to throw rainwater clear of the balcony edge. Additional guidance includes podium roofs shall be protected by a fully coordinated waterproofing and drainage system, have third party accreditation, proof of performance from relevant testing for roof penetration, durability for waterproofing of concrete surfaces trafficable by vehicles, comply with standards chapter 5.4. The makeup of waterproofing layer and topping should follow the guidance given for the individual waterproofing layers and toppings quoted within this chapter and to suit the type of deck that has been used to form the podium. Considerations must also be given to the emergency vehicle traffic at the planning stage and where necessary, waterproofing and structural designs must be capable of accommodating foreseeable loading. Gap spacings between decking elements have been aligned to BS8579 between six to eight millimeters. In the definitions for the chapter, there is clarification that an upstand should be a minimum of 150 millimeters unless serving an accessible threshold where this height can be reduced to 75 millimeters. Clause 7.117 is new. It states that metal balcony framework structures should be designed and constructed as recommended in BS 8579 guidance for the design of balconies and terraces and their component parts. The 2024 NHBC standards are available on our website. If you would prefer to obtain a printed copy, they can be available from mid-January. The cost of the printed copy is £99 plus delivery. The copy will be sent within a week of placing your order. Thank you for listening to this webinar on changes made to chapter 6.2 to 7.1. This covers part of the changes to the NHBC standards 2024. The changes to other sections will be made available. Further information can be found on our website.